Okay, how are you guys this morning? So we've got um, finals on Monday at eight and on Tuesday at eight, right? So which sections, which class, sorry, not sections, let's do it by chapter. Which chapters do you guys want on Monday and which chapters do you guys want on Tuesday? Um, didn't you say something um, kind of like pairing an easier chapter with like a harder chapter? Is I think that... that's what we should do, yeah. But to me, they're all easy chapters, so I don't know what you guys want to do with that. Maybe two and five and six. Yeah, could we do that one on... Um... Tuesday though? Two, five, and six on Tuesday. And that leaves three and four on Monday. Does anybody have a different idea? And then wouldn't that almost like group them together in a, like a little bit of a sense, like five and six are about the same kind of things and then three and four are about the same kind of things? Yes. It'd be kind of easier. So I like that idea. Okay. This is my initial thought too. So, okay. But we'll go with that. Um, I'll open up the exams at 745 again. You'll have until uh, 10 to complete them. Uh, there'll probably be about 20 questions, about 10 from each chapter. Maybe there'll be a couple more questions on Tuesday because I got two more sections, but I might leave out some of the chapter two questions too. I think, I think I'll try and keep them around 20 questions a piece. Um, questions on this. Um, in terms of like the questions themselves, is it, can we expect it kind of similar to the difficulty of the other tests? Yeah. Um, the very first test was kind of anomalous, but the last two, I think you could, I'm going to do it via my lab math again. So similar to those guys. Is it going to be multiple choice? Um, I will try and throw in some multiple choice. I didn't see the multiple choice questions on this last test. The first, the chapter four one, they, I could find them somewhere, but for the chapter five one, I, I don't know where they were. So if I find multiple choice questions, I'll put some in. So if we have two hours uh, and there's only 20 questions, do you think we're going to need that whole time? I, I don't, I don't think so, but you have the whole time if you want it. Um, if you've been getting done with the, the 15 questions in an hour, I think you'd be plenty good for 20 questions in two. Um, this is kind of about like the class as a whole now, but um, originally uh, the chapter six was like extra credit because we we're going to do the whole thing, weren't we? But then now I'm just wondering, is, is there is there like other extra credit in like other places now? So I think you heard, I heard you maybe say that the assignments are worth 10 points individually. Is that like to make up the... No, so all the sections were initially thought to be 10, 10 points, except for the chapter one stuff, which was extra credit. Um, I think we were going to do, uh, 370 points, 37 sections sounds about right. And we ended up only doing like 30 
32 or 33. And so instead of being out of 350 points, I think it's going to be out of 300 is what the homework's going to be out of. I'll have to look at the numbers, but you'll still have some extra to play with there. And I think everybody's doing really pretty good with the homework. But yeah, all the sections are still worth 10 points, except for the chapter one stuff, which was worth two points a section. And those didn't count towards the total number of homework points. Does that answer your question? Yep. You said yesterday that uh, sometime this week, you're gonna try giving us a grade as to where we are right now. Do you yeah, I was meaning to do it yesterday, but I got really tired. I took two naps yesterday and I did get the chapter five tests updated, graded. So those are done. I'll try and put the spreadsheet together today. Anything else like bookkeeping wise you guys have questions about or Um, how long would it be after the final until we get like our final final grade in the class? I think I have to have grades in by Tuesday, but since these are done on Tuesday, I expect to be done like probably by Thursday or Friday for sure. I don't expect that it's going to take me through the weekend to do it, but. Okay. And I will put two of us, uh, <laughs> I will put two assignments up in Canvas for you guys to upload scratch work. One for the Monday part and one for the Tuesday part. Okay, do you have uh, any review questions, sections, chapters you guys want to talk about? Um, could we look at like linearization and just like the beginning differentials? Sure. So let's draw some pictures. So the linearization is, it's just an approximation at a point. And what you get is to get to this value over here, I'm gonna put a little hat on the F, so it's an approximate F. This is x, the actual f of x. Um, this is x naught comma f of x naught. So we're gonna start at x naught and I can turn this thing into a triangle here. And the slope on that triangle is the slope of the, the, the function, right? So that slope is F prime. 
this side, this is x minus x naught, how far you go in the in the x direction to get from where you started at x naught to where you're going at x. Okay, so where you're going minus where you started is how far you went. And then this side would be f prime at x naught, the slope at x naught times how far you went. So that, that side there is f prime times x minus x naught. And this is how far the function has changed from the original point at x naught, and that's going to be the approximate f at x. And that's our tangent line. This is the this is the tangent line. You you start at a point, and then how much do you change by is approximated by how far you go times what the slope of the function is at that point. So this is your tangent line approximation. And that's where we get these, these differentials too, right? The differential says, well, what's the change? The approximate change is what you approximate the function to be minus the, the original function value, which is equal to x minus x naught. I'm just solving, I'm moving this over and then this is what I have, f prime x naught. This is delta y approximately. Is equal to this, which is equal to, and that's where you get your, your differentials. This, this is your differential here. Your dy equals y minus y not, uh, sorry, x minus x not. Times dx. That's, that's basically what you get for your differentials there. You want to know how much the output changes? Well, how much did the input change and what was the approximation of the input? So let's do some questions on that. I think that was Is that four or five maybe? I think it's in chapter three. Chapter three. Three eleven. Okay. Any of these topics look Like one of these that you want to do? Um, maybe solve applications involving the linears and their. Okay, so I'm not going to, um, so this is, this is a shell, right? So this, if I unroll it, if I like cut it in some spot, all right, we've got this picture. If I like cut it here and unroll it, right? It's going to look kind of flat, but there will be like an angle after I unroll it. So it's not going to be perfectly rectangular, but we're going to pretend that that angle doesn't exist, that it's actually rectangular. And so this thing's going to be like the D width 
is how far this is up down. Okay. And so how this works is, I'm thinking about, okay, the cylinder that's solid. As radius r, length h, oh, let's call it length l, that has volume pi r squared times length, right? But what we want to do is we want to find the, the approximate volume of the shell here. And this shell is the difference between, say, that solid cylinder and a solid cylinder with a slightly bigger radius. So I'm gonna take the, the change in the volume would be the volume of the, the, the shell. And that's with respect to the radius. So dVdr equals two pi r l dr. We'll put the dr over here instead of on the dVdr side. Okay, so in our picture, what do we have? We have two pi, we've got nine as the radius, we've got 10 as the length, and we've got dr is 0.4. So this is gonna be approximately what the volume of this shell is. So that's, uh, 72 pi. Three inches. Do we see how we use differentials there? Yes. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Do we want to try another one? Um, I I'm probably good. Okay. Other people have questions or Matt, if you get more questions. Can we look at one of those that uses the like boxes and deltas and others? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I don't know. Big eleven, but I uh, um, how like the n values it was like finding areas under curves. Oh, um, okay. Like estimating areas of finite sums. These type of things. Um, I don't think it was that. It was earlier on. I think it was chapter four, maybe. As you draw a bunch of like rectangles. Well, I guess we did that with this too. But I, it was kind of um you know what you can maybe do a different question i'll see if i can find one in the notes and then i'll tell you okay something else people want to look at <coughs> man hope you guys never get this thing Can we do an optimization one? Sorry, what? An optimization one. Optimization? Yeah. Yeah, review that a little bit.
um, business, biology, physics, geometry. Um, probably more geometry. Does this look like a good one? Sure. So we need to draw a picture first to figure out what our constraint function and our objective function are. So I've got an open topped right circular cylinder. So I can see into this. Um, it's going to have a height H. It's going to have a radius R. Label everything that I need to know for the volume <laughs> and surface area and that sort of stuff. Uh, lightest. So we're probably going to want the smallest amount of material. So we want to minimize. the surface area with the constraint that the volume is equal to 9261, okay? So the surface area of this is pi r squared plus two pi r h. This is the lateral sides area. This is the bottoms area. There's only the bottom. There's not a top because it's open topped. And the volume, which is 92.61 is equal to pi r squared h. So I'm given this constraint and I'm given this objective. Okay, my goal is to find the minimum on the objective function, but it's in two variables right now. I've got an H and an R. So I have to use my constraint to get rid of one of them. Um, might as well solve for H because that's easy, right? Just divide by pi R squared. So my new objective function is this, I can cancel out some of that stuff. I get pi r squared plus two times 92.61 over R equals surface area. I wanna minimize this. So I'm gonna find where the derivative is zero. Um, take the derivative, I get that. I set this equal to zero. Cancel the twos. We get R cubed equals ninety two sixty one over pi. So R equals the cube root, 92.61 over pi. And then H, we already solved for H in terms of R. H was right here. Oh, 
pi r squared, not two pi r. So that's 92.61 divided by pi square root cube root 92.61 over pi squared. Uh, so that's, well, I take away two thirds of a 92.61. I'm left with one third of a 92.61. The pi is also, I'm also going to get the same thing. I get equals the cube root of 92.61 or pi again. Looks like that's what the arithmetic does. So they're both the same. Okay, where do we have questions on that one? Um, when do you know when to take the derivative on that? So we got our objective function in one variable. Mm -hmm. Right. At, at this point here. Yeah. As soon as you have the objective function in one variable, we know that um, as a function then that has a graph. Mm -hmm. right? And I can find where the minimum is by finding where the derivative of that function is zero. Okay. So as soon as you have it in one variable, I could graph it out in the Cartesian coordinate system. And then geometry wise, if I wanna find where the derivative is zero, that's gonna give me my minimums. So once I get here, I can start doing just regular differential stuff. Does that make sense? Why that's where we do it? Yeah, that does. Okay. Um, will there be any derivative ones where we have to use the limit definition of derivative to find it instead of using like the way we know to do it now? Um, I don't think so. I think, I mean, I will ask you questions about limits and that type of stuff, but I don't think I'll specifically say, find the derivative of this function using the limit definition of derivative. Okay. But there will be questions about limits. Okay. Um, could we go over just this question I have written down here? It's that, so take the limit, uh, as tangent to a negative first, or well, I guess uh, arc tangent of x as x approaches infinity. So here, tangent zero, right at that point, tangents one at this point. V 
because that length and that length are the same at this point, this length and this length, it's about three times as big. So I'd say the tangent's about three here. As I get closer and closer to this value up here, right, the length this way versus the length this way, this becomes infinitely infinitely many times taller than it is wide. Does that make sense? So as I'm going around the circle, the tangent as I get closer to this point up here, gets closer to infinity. So as I approach there, the tangent goes towards infinity. The arc tangent just flips this statement around. Does that help with thinking about that problem? Yes. Okay. So this is this is pi over two. Could you do the ones for arc sine and arc cosine as well? Sure. Okay, so the sine and cosine never get close to infinity. So the arc sine at infinity doesn't make any sense, but let's draw the sine function. Looks kind of like this, right? And the arc sine function, what it does is it takes the one-to-one -one portion so that I can take a, an inverse function which is between negative pi over two and pi over two for the sine function. And what it does is it flips this across the line x equals y so that I find the inverse function. So if this is the sine of x, There's my arc sine of X. And had this continued on, it would look like that. But it doesn't, it's just stops there and it stops there. Okay. And so I can find the limit of the arc sine anywhere between negative one and one. The endpoints are the ones that kind of make the most sense. So I'm going to put in like, say, as X approaches one. And as X approaches one, that means that the ratio is getting closer and closer to one, right? And for the ratio to get closer and closer to one, the angle has to be getting closer and closer to pi over two. If I put in a minus one, I would get a minus pi over two because then my ratio would be getting closer and closer to minus one and I'd be getting closer to negative pi over two. Cosine would work the same way. Does that help? Yeah. Other things you guys want to talk about? Um, can we look a little bit at like related rates? I think it was in chapter three. Yeah.
Does one look okay? Yeah. Okay, so you've got a drop of mist, it's perfect sphere, and through condensation, the drop, excuse me, <laughs> picks up moisture <clears throat> at a rate proportional to its surface area. Okay, show that these circumstances, the drop radius increases at a constant rate. So. We've got a sphere, radius R. The volume is 4 thirds pi R cube. Surface area is 4 pi R squared. Um, If you'll notice, if you take the derivative of volume with respect to the radius, you end up with the surface area. Um, it's not really a coincidence, but it's a nice way to think about those things sometimes. And not necessarily relative to this, but uh, yeah. well, it kind of is relative to this, be irrelevant, but not be. The, the drop picks up moisture at a rate proportional to its surface area. So dV dt is equal to k times the surface area. So we understand why that statement is the statement that the drop picks up moisture at a rate proportional to its surface area. The rate of the change of volume is proportional to the surface area. So you get this proportionality constant times the actual surface area, right? And this is K times four pi R squared. So that under these circumstances, the drops radius increases at a constant rate. So we want to find dr dt. Because if I can find dr dt, I will get uh, the rate of change of the the radius. Okay, so here we're just going to write down these things that I've already written down. I've got four pi r cubed over three, and surface area is four pi r squared. TVDT is um, Oh, dVdt is four pi r squared dr dt. Just taking the derivative of the volume with respect to time. We good with that? Um, there's K times the surface area, which I wrote down already. All right, and now 
what we're doing. We want the RDT. We got the DVDT is four pi r squared drdt. But I also have dvdt is k times four pi r squared. So we will set these two equal to each other. You get k four pi r squared equals four pi r squared dr dt. Well, that all cancels k equals dr dt. Which is that constant. We're good with that? Yep. So the idea with the related rates is you set up expressions like the volume equals four pi r cubed over three. And you think of each of the variables as a function of time or some, some other variable, but you can differentiate using the chain rule, right? So I had volume is four thirds pi r cubed. If I think of R as a function of time, I can use the chain rule on this. Get the derivative of volume as the function of time, dt, 4 thirds pi. The chain rule says the derivative of R cubed is 3R squared times dr dt. Because the inside function is R, I have to multiply by the derivative of R with respect to time. I've got a chain rule thing going on, the threes end up canceling and, and we move on from there. But you keep thinking of the chain rule um, when you're taking these derivatives. Let's, any questions on this one? I wanna do another one because this one wasn't necessarily the easiest conceptually. So we've got a sphere again. So I got volume as four thirds pi r cubed. We wanna know how fast is the balloon's radius increasing. So we want dr dt at r equals three. Okay. So to get dr dt at r equals three, Um, I know that dv dt is 4 pi r squared dr dt. Just still taking derivatives on both sides with respect to time because I want to compare the, the relate, the rate of volume increase here. That's the rate of volume increase, and I want to compare that to the rate of radius increase. So this works perfect for me because I've got the rate of volume increase related to the rate of radius increase now. We're told that the volume is increasing at 180 pi cubic feet per minute. So that's equal to four pi times r squared times dr dt. And that's constant no matter what the radius is, right? Because I've got this thing hooked up to a tank or something and the tank's just shooting helium in at the same rate the entire time. Okay. And so I get to cancel the pi's. The four turns the 180 into 45. So I got 45 feet cubed per minute 
equals r squared dr dt. And we want to know this at the point where r is equal to 3. So 45 feet cubed per minute equals 9 times dr dt. Nines in feet squared. So I get five feet per minute is how fast this radius is increasing. Where do we have questions on that one? That one's a little simpler. Where did you get the 45? 180 divided by four. Okay. Other questions on that one? Okay, how am I gonna do surface area? Well, Surface area is four pi r squared. So d surface area dt is eight pi r dr dt. We want to know this that the radius is three. So is going to be 24 pi times dr dt at radius equals 3, but we just calculated that. That was 5. So 120 pi feet squared per minute. Okay. Questions on that part of, part of it? Um, let's say it wanted like a surface area at a different radius than the last one that we calculated. Would we just go back and do like the first step again to get a different DRDT? Yep. DRDT at that new time yeah, or yeah. that new radius. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, some of you guys were asking me about how to find that second derivative on the project. You've got those first derivatives all written out already, right? You've got like uh, DSDT equals something in terms of I, in terms of all your stuff, right? something like this. Well, to find the second derivative, I'm just using the same idea, right? So ds d squared s dt squared. I'm gonna take the derivative of this. So it's gonna be alpha s prime plus beta i prime plus gamma r prime. And then these things are derivatives that we already have written down somewhere. So you can just fill them in. It's a lot like this related rate stuff. It's just implicit differentiation. Um, to get the second derivative, you just take the derivative of the first derivative. You have the first derivative written down, you just have to take the derivative of it. Okay. Other questions you have today? How is the project coming?
Okay. Other questions you guys want to talk about? Other chapter sections? Well, um, if you guys think of something, email me or bring it to class tomorrow. We'll, we'll do more one more day of review tomorrow. Um, then Monday at like 745, I said the test will open up in my math lab again. So open at 745, close at 10. Uh, I say about 20 questions each Monday and Tuesday. So. I'll let you guys go if nobody else has questions. Yeah, see you guys tomorrow.